everybody and welcome back to Ape Nation, your number one source for all things Planet of the Apes on YouTube. My name is Josh and today I'm continuing my series of reviews for every single Planet of the Apes movie with the first entry in the rebooted series of films that will continue with Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes this May, 2011's Rise of the Planet of the Apes. If you like what I do here and want to show your support, be sure to hit the like button on this video, subscribe to the channel, and hit that notification bell so that you can stay up to date on all things apes. And as always, before we get started with this review, let's first take a little bit of a dive into the film's behind the scenes history. Following the release of 2001's Planet of the Apes, Fox was interested in developing a sequel, but in the aftermath of the film's rush production, when asked about returning to direct a follow-up, filmmaker Tim Burton was quoted as saying, I'd rather jump out a window. Soon after, the project was scrapped, and the franchise would return to its previously dormant state for the next several years. In 2006, screenwriter Rick Joppa, known primarily at the time for 1996's Eye for an Eye and 1997's The Relic, was searching for his next idea for a script, eventually coming across an old new newspaper article clipping about a pet chimpanzee that turned on his owner. Jaffa quickly realized that this story would be a good fit for the Planet of the Apes franchise, soon afterward collaborating with his wife and screenwriting partner Amanda Silver, as the pair thought that a chimp like that could start an ape revolution, which then led to the development of the character of Caesar. When asked about where the project lands in the overall Planet of the Apes mythology, Jaffa called it a reinvention and that if he had to pick between calling it a prequel or a reboot, he would say it's a reboot, going on to say, We tried really hard to create a story that would stand on its own, and yet also pay homage and honor the movies that came before us. Rick Jaffa and Amanda Silver's Caesar character soon became a script, which they later added other elements to, such as the concept of genetic engineering, as well as references and homages to other Planet of the Apes films. The pair then got it sold to 20th Century Fox. Director Rupert Wyatt, who was hot off The Escapist, signed on to the film soon after, and on his approach to the film was quoted as saying, It's not a continuation of the other films. It's an original story. It does satisfy the people who enjoy those films. The point of this film is to achieve that and to bring that fan base into this film exactly like Batman Begins. Mark Bomback, who prior to this film was known primarily for films like Live Free or Die Hard, Race to Witch Mountain, Unstoppable, The Total Recall Remake, and The Wolverine, later did an uncredited rewrite of the script. He would then eventually go on to co-write the two follow-up films Dawn and War with Matt Reeves. As the apes and Rise were meant to look real, the producers decided not to use actors in suits. After considering real apes, Weta Digital was hired to create the apes digitally through performance capture. Advances in technology allowed the use of performance capture in an exterior environment, giving the filmmakers the freedom to shoot a lot of the film on location with other actors, as opposed to relying on sound stages in heavily green screen environments. While shooting, the filmmakers would get each shot twice, once with the human actors interacting with ape actors in their motion capture suits, and then again with just the humans for a clean shot to be used. Actor and stuntman Terry Notary, who had been an ape choreography coach on Tim Burton's Planet of the Apes back in 2001, returned again to guide the ape actors on realistic ape movement. Notary also had a role in the film as the character Rocket, as well as being a stand-in for Andy Serkis during some of the more stunt-heavy scenes. Andy Serkis was hired to play Caesar after years of motion capture work playing characters like Gollum in Lord of the Rings, as well as the title character in Peter Jackson's 2005 remake of King Kong. The score for the film was written by Patrick Doyle, most known at the time for films like Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, and the first Thor movie. Doyle's biggest goal was for the music to help progress the plot in scenes without dialogue and conveying the emotions of Caesar. He wanted to, quote, turn the score into a driving force that keeps audiences paying attention. The film began shooting on July 27, 2010 and wrapped on September 17th, with filming taking place primarily in Vancouver, with additional filming in San Francisco, California, as well as Oahu, Hawaii. The film was made for a budget of $93 million and was released on August 5, 2011 to overwhelmingly positive reviews. The film went on to become one of the most surprising hits of the summer with a worldwide box office total of $481.8 million. The film was also nominated for Best Visual Effects at the 2012 Academy Awards, becoming the first film since the original back in 1968 to receive an Oscar nomination. So as for my experience with Rise of the Planet of the Apes, I started keeping up with film industry news not long after watching the original movies for the first time, so this would have been probably around 2008, 2009, somewhere in that time frame. Around the same time was when development of this movie was really starting to pick up the pace, and so soon after I'd seen the original movies, I found out about a new Apes movie, and at this point it was still only in the development stage, so filming had not started yet, but this began my journey of keeping up with 
with the development and keeping up with the whole process, constantly checking all the movie news sites, waiting for any scrap of new information to drop. I could not wait to see this movie. I was so excited for a new Planet of the Apes movie. As we got closer to the release, as filming started, we started getting production photos, seeing Andy Serkis in a motion capture suit and all that kind of stuff. I thought it was really cool. Eventually, in 2011, we started getting the trailers. <laughs> I was so excited. I thought the trailers looked amazing. And back then, and maybe I'm wrong about this, maybe my memory is incorrect, or maybe I just remember it differently. But I do remember a lot of the talk around this movie being who wants this? Why are we making this movie? Planet of the Apes is a dead franchise. This looks like a silly, cheesy B movie. No one's going to care about this, whatever. Meanwhile, me being a relatively new fan of the franchise at the time, seeing all the trailers, seeing Planet of the Apes finally come back for the first time in a decade, I was so excited. I loved the trailers. I thought it looked like a really great movie. So fast forward to opening weekend. I saw the movie with my dad. I think it was the Saturday that it came out and I was so, so happy. The second it ended, I knew immediately that I loved it and I was just so excited. And I've mentioned this before, but when I first saw the original movies, I immediately got this obsession with the franchise. It made me want to dive into it more, made me want to go learn more about it, just continue watching the movies over and over again. I wanted to get all of the Planet of the Apes stuff that I could. And when I saw the Tim Burton remake, I didn't have that feeling. This movie brought that feeling back and instantly after I saw it, I was ready to see it again. I was ready to see the next movie. I wanted to go back and rewatch the original movies. I was already excited to start following the production of what would become Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. And so I had an amazing time watching the movie when I saw it in the theaters and a couple months later after it came out on Blu-ray and digital I immediately bought it day one and I re-watched it again and again and again I watched all the special features I would watch all the behind the scenes stuff I was obsessed with this movie and so that's a lot of why this movie has such a special place in my heart and I think maybe I love it a little more than other people do I think when people look back on this trilogy they tend to look at this as the weak link but for me it's not a weak link it may be my least favorite of the three but it's not a weak link by a mile it definitely has maybe a couple more flaws, but I love it and it means a lot to me. And now I'm going to get into why. Caesar, a chimpanzee who gains human-like intelligence and emotions from an experimental drug, is raised like a child by the drug's creator, Will Rodman. After years of knowing nothing but domesticated life, Caesar finds himself taken from the humans he loves and is imprisoned in an ape sanctuary. Seeking justice and freedom for his fellow ape inmates, the highly intelligent Caesar ignites an ape rebellion, putting man and ape on a collision course that could change the planet forever. As always, starting off with the cast and with the characters of the movie, the movie stars James Franco as Will Rodman, the human who adopts baby Caesar. I have always really enjoyed him. I think he has always given and really solid performances. This I would say is, I don't know if I'd say it's one of his weaker ones, but I'd say it's one of his middle tier ones. My only issue with him in this movie really is just, I find it hard to buy him as a scientist. He seems just a little bit too young to be someone who's doing what he's doing in this movie, someone who's been working on a cure for Alzheimer's for so many years. But beyond that, I do think he does pretty well in the role. I think the character is pretty likable. And what I really like about him is the relationship between him and Caesar. I think it's really sweet and I think it's the the emotional core of the movie. Franco does a really good job in his scenes with Andy Serkis showing that father-son dynamic that they have and it's really touching in a lot of moments and I think Franco does a really good job overall. I know some people wanted to see him pop up again in Dawn and War for the Planet of the Apes in some capacity but for the most part I'm perfectly fine that he didn't show up. I think his story was told in this movie and I don't think we needed him beyond that but I do like the character for the most part. We also have John Lithgow as Charles Rodman, Will's father and I've really like him in this movie. Honestly, as far as characters and acting goes, I would say Charles is probably the best of all the human characters in the entire movie. I think he's great. I think his performance feels very touching and very genuine in a lot of moments, and especially the moments with him and Caesar and him talking about Caesar. I think the character also serves the story and the heart of the film really, really well. And then as for Frida Pinto, who plays kind of the love interest of James Franco's character, Will Caroline, she's fine. I like Frida Pinto as an actress, and for the most part I do like her in this movie but she doesn't really get to do much. Caroline is a for the most part very likable character but to some degree she kind of feels like an afterthought but she has a couple moments where she does serve the story where she needs to. That all being said, the real star of this movie is not a human character and that would be Andy Serkis as Caesar. 
Andy Serkis is phenomenal in this movie. He gives what I think is probably in this movie and the following two films. I mean, I know it's separate performances, but I really just look at his acting in all these movies as one big performance. And I think it's the best acting that's ever been done in the entire Planet of the Apes franchise. And I know that there's a lot of discourse still to this day about should performance capture roles be eligible for Oscars and why they shouldn't be, why they should be. I know there's a whole bunch of discourse surrounding that. There was when it came out and it's still going on to this day. And I understand all the people that say it, why they shouldn't. And there's definitely valid arguments, but I look at this performance and I see an incredibly talented actor pouring his heart and soul into this movie and into this character. And I remember thinking when I saw the movie, this deserves to be recognized. This is an incredible performance. This is so good. And he just does such an incredible job at conveying so many different emotions and so many different types of expressions through his eyes and his body language. I mean, there are really specific scenes where you look into Caesar's eyes. If you know Andy Serkis, the actor, you can see in his eyes the expressiveness. You can see Andy Serkis in there. Trying to control things that are not meant to be controlled. The 112 works. Do you realize how you sound? What I'm saying is this is a good thing. Caesar's proof of that. So is my father. The more I've gotten to see Andy Serkis as an actor and watch all of his different roles and see what he can bring to the table as a performer, and then you go back and rewatch this movie as well as the other two, you can really see and hear and feel him in this role. It's not just a digital performance. It is an actor playing this role with digital enhancements, of course, and how much work the people at Weta Digital and the motion capture artists and the visual effects artists and everyone involved in bringing this character and all the other eight characters to life. It can't be understated just how much time and work and effort they put into making everything look as good as it does in this movie and making it believable and helping the movie feel believable. They did such an incredible job and I'm going to talk about more of that in just a little bit. But at the end of the day, you can't do what this movie does and you can't have a character that works as well as this character does without a great performance at the center of it. And you get that from Andy Serkis. And just as a character, Caesar has such a powerful and compelling arc. And to me, I think it might be the most relatable and human character Character, not just in the entire movie, but in the entire Planet of the Apes franchise. He's a character that you just want to root for from the beginning. He's so likable, and that's without even having any dialogue. It's just his eyes and his mannerisms and who he is as a character and the relationships that he forms with Will and with Charles and with Caroline. It makes you buy into and believe and love this character, and that's why he's become one of the most beloved characters to come out of movies in the last 15 years. And I would honestly make an argument that he is the best character to come out of any blockbuster, maybe in the entirety of the 21st century. Maybe that's hyperbole, but he is so incredibly well realized and he only gets better with each film. But in this movie, I love Caesar so much and that is so much to do with how great of a job Andy Serkis does in the role. Caesar is the heart and soul of the movie from start to finish and it would not be the same without him. Moving on to the rest of the cast, some of the more supporting characters, you have David Oyelowo as Jacobs, who is maybe not necessarily the main villain. There isn't really a main villain in the movie, but if there was one, I would say it's personified by Jacobs, as well as another character that I'll get to next. He's, for the most part, just a one-note bad guy. He's just the evil corporate guy who is putting money above all else, and it makes it pretty easy to hate him, but Oyelowo is good in the role. I've always found him to be a really good actor. I thought he was incredible in Selma, which is probably still the best I think he's ever done. So he's a really good actor, and I think he does enough to kind of elevate the character and make him a little more enjoyable to watch in certain scenes. But for the most part, he's just a one note villain. He's nothing really that memorable. But I do like that by the end of the movie, you almost get joy out of rooting against him. So I do appreciate him for that. You also have Tom Felton, who everyone knows and loves from the Harry Potter movies. Of course, I do as someone who grew up with those movies as Dodge Landon, which I always thought was a little on the nose, but a fun reference to the original movies, just calling him Dodge Landon. But he plays probably the worst character in the entire movie, and honestly, one of the worst characters in the entire trilogy. He's just there to be the one who pushes Caesar to the edge and show him the dark side of humans. And I just wish there was a little more depth to the character. I understand that there's only so much you can do, and, and something I'll talk about later is the pacing, and I think it would have negatively affected the pacing if you would have dedicated too 
too much time to this character and showing maybe some of his more human side, but he's just such an over-the-top angsty villain, and he only exists to push Caesar's buttons and push Caesar's story forward. He just is mean to the apes. There's no reason given. He just is, and it's fine. It works for the story. For the most part, he just comes off as kind of a cartoon villain. Rounding out the rest of the cast, we also have Brian Cox as John Landon and Tyler Labine as Franklin. I think both of them are pretty solid in the movie, especially Franklin. I do like his moments in the movie. I think he is a fun little character. And then rounding out the rest of the ape main cast, you have Rocket, played by Terry Notary, Maurice, played by Karen Canoval, and Buck, played by Richard Ridings. I love all three of these guys in this movie. Rocket, I think, is a character that has a fun little enemy to ally dynamic and shift with Caesar throughout the movie. I like how that happens. I like how that forms. And Maurice, who goes on to become one of the best characters in the entire trilogy, is awesome. I think Maurice is a great companion to Caesar and just a very easily lovable character. No one can hate Maurice. He's always there for Caesar. He's always there to help him, and he just gets better and better throughout the rest of the series. And then you have, honestly, my favorite favorite of the three, Buck. I love Buck so much. He is honestly kind of not talked about enough. Whenever people talk about who their favorite characters are and talk about their favorite moments, and they always talk about Dawn and War and talk about Maurice a lot and talk about Rocket a lot, and even talking about Luca from War for the Planet of the Apes, but nobody really seems to ever talk about Buck. And I don't know why, because he's awesome. He's so cool. He's such a badass. He's such a good friend. And he's such a loyal friend to Caesar after Caesar helps him escape. They have such a strong relationship between the two. And at the end of the movie, when... <laughs> Buck gives his life for Caesar and saves him. It's a really heartbreaking moment, and I get really emotional whenever I watch it. It is so sad, but it's a really great moment, and I think Buck is such a great character in this movie. He's one of the best parts of it, and he doesn't get talked about enough, so I just wanted to shout out Buck for a quick minute. Getting a little bit more into the story and what the film is actually about, I think this has such a clever premise for rebooting the Planet of the Apes franchise. What Rick Jaffa and Amanda Silver came up with was so smart, and it was such a great way to modernize the series for a modern day audience with a much more grounded approach. Using the Alzheimer's cure was such a smart and really interesting way to go. And I have more to say about that when we get to War for the Planet of the Apes, but because of what Alzheimer's is and what it actually does, using that as the basis for the virus that would eventually wipe out mankind as well as make apes intelligent is, again, just so incredibly smart. And so I really, really appreciated what they were able to do and the approach that they took for bringing the apes franchise back. Something I also really love is the way that it tells a story about revolution under the guise of an origin story. On the surface, you look at this movie and it's about the ape uprising. It's about the beginning stages of how the apes rose to power. But under all that, it's just an origin story about this character of Caesar, where he came from, what he went through, and how he became the character that he eventually becomes later in the series. And I think that works in a really clever way that hasn't been done in the franchise thus far, and it brings something exciting and fresh to the table. There's definitely hints of conquest of the Planet of the Apes, and it very clearly takes takes heavy inspiration and influence from that movie, which is another thing that I really appreciate about it, but it does its own thing with it. It changes a lot of things up. It takes the general idea of that movie, and obviously it takes the character's name of Caesar from that movie, but I think it improves pretty much everything about that movie. It takes things that that movie was doing and what it was trying to say and what kind of story it was telling, but I think it modernizes it and it improves a lot of it and does something new with it, and it does its own thing. And one other thing that that I really like is that, and this is something that people were saying about the movie prior to its release, is that it looked like it's just a silly B movie. It just looks like a weird little movie about monkeys taking over the world, right? And this movie 100% could have been that. It could have just been a silly little B movie. But with the incredible filmmaking and the great writing and the great performances and the character work, they take this, what could be just a stupid little concept, and they turn it into something genuine and they make it smart and it takes itself seriously and it takes its character seriously. And as a viewer and as a fan, I just appreciate that so much. And I'm not gonna call out any movies or anything. I don't wanna start anything, but like you definitely see in some modernized franchise reboots or sequels or whatever that sometimes Times, there's just this lack of earnestness. There's this lack of sincerity. And certain movies feel like they have to wink at the camera or they have 
to let you know, yeah, we know this is stupid. We know this is kind of silly. Just go with it, right? And this movie doesn't do that. It takes itself seriously. It is committing to itself 100% and it's all the better for it. And I really, really appreciate that a lot about this movie and just about the entire trilogy in general. It's okay. Then getting into some of the world building of this film, and it's a bit different than what we've seen with the original Apes films, because this is the beginning of a trilogy. But what I do really appreciate about this movie is that it's setting up these building blocks of the ape civilization and their language. And it's set up really, really well. You have things like the apes using sign language, Caesar's window, which goes on to become a massive part of the series. It becomes this symbol for the revolution and a symbol of the apes. The hand signing thing with apes asking Caesar for permission. All these little things are set up so well that are then continued on and paid off in the later movies and utilized and developed and built out and I really like seeing all that stuff set up here and it's done in a really effective way but it also doesn't spend too much time on it. I also like how the virus spreading is handled. We see how it's set up and sprinkled in throughout the movie just in little bits but it works. It's all you really need and it works in setting up the downfall of the human civilization that we'll see over the next two movies. Getting into more of the filmmaking of all of it, I think this is one of the more well-paced Planet of the Apes movies. There's little to almost no fat whatsoever. It moves really fast, but it doesn't feel rushed. While it's only about an hour and 40 something minutes, it tells you a lot and it gets everything that it needs to get across to you as the viewer for you to emotionally connect with the characters and for you to get into the story and get all wrapped up in everything. And it's able to do so very quickly and it's able to do so while continuing to get through the story in a not too long of an amount of time. And it does it very quickly and effectively. And I really appreciate the pace of the movie as a whole. Rupert Wyatt also does a great job with visual storytelling, specifically during the ape sanctuary scenes where it's just apes using sign language. He does a really great job at engaging you in the characters without any of the dialogue. And that's a really hard thing to do and do well and get people engaged on an emotional level in any kind of way. And he does it multiple times throughout the movie when you are watching the apes just talk to each other through sign language. You are hooked into what these apes are saying to each other because you care about them and because of the work of the performances and because of the believability of the apes. Rupert Wyatt also does a great job at understanding that the ape sanctuary is where most of the interesting story is and keeps the less interesting humans to a minimum as it goes on. The first half of the movie is for the most part Will and Caesar as well as all the stuff going on at Genesis. But the second half, once Caesar goes to the ape sanctuary, a lot of the movie is on his shoulders and we kind of shift protagonists in a way. Caesar is a co-star and he's a character in the first half of the movie, but Will is kind of the one leading the way. But once we get to that second half, Caesar is the one who's leading the rest of this story to its end. And that's where it gets really, really compelling. And like I said, those human scenes that we do still get in the second half of the movie, they're kept to a minimum. We just get the stuff that we need to get. And then we get back to the apes. There's no moment where you're going, can we pick this up? Can we get out of here? I want to get back to seeing what Caesar's doing. Anytime we're going to Genesis to see what's going on with the scientists or anytime we're checking in with seeing what's up with Will, it's still stuff that is interesting, but you're not spending so much time with it that you get bored and want to go back to Caesar. I also really like that there's some really fun nods to the original movie. Some of them do feel forced, but I do appreciate them as a fan. They're really, really fun. And one of them in particular leads to what I think is one of the greatest moments in movie history. And that is when this scene happens. <laughs> Thinking far off me, you damn 38! No! This is a scene that has stuck with me since the minute I saw it in August of 2011. You could hear a pin drop in the theater when this happened. It was so dead silent. Everyone was shocked about what just happened. It was so well done. This is just such an incredible reveal. To me, this is the Statue of Liberty moment of this new series of movies. This is the Statue of Liberty moment of the Caesar trilogy. 
it's such a great reveal. And when you're watching the movie, at least the first time when I was watching the movie, in the back of my head, I was going, are the apes going to talk at some point? But because you're so invested in everything going on, you're not thinking about that when this is happening. You're just thinking, this is a great story. This is a great character. I care about what's going on. And I'm so interested in what's happening. And then the moment happens and is one of the most iconic moments in the entire series and one of my favorite moments in a movie ever. I could go on forever just gushing about this moment for the rest of the review. I'm not going to, but I still think about that scene and I think it still might be my favorite scene in the entire trilogy. It's so good and it just sticks with you. And it's the thing that I think a lot of people walked away from with this movie going, that's the moment where I said, hell yes, I'm in. This is an awesome movie. I also think that the film does a really great job in getting you to hate the humans and root for the apes to take over by the end. Obviously, if you know Planet of the Apes, you know where this whole thing is going, but it's one thing to just get dumped into 1968's Planet of the Apes that takes place 2000 years in the future where apes are already ruling the world. It's another thing entirely to start in our world and and watch that completely go downhill and watch apes take over it. The fact that the movie is able to make you root against humans, root against our own world that we see in the movie and root for the apes to take over is really good. The way that Rupert Wyatt is able to do that and Rick Jaffa and Amanda Silver were able to do that and pull that off is really, really impressive. And then there's the third act, which is an epic, satisfying, emotional roller coaster that balances spectacle, character and story. is thrilling and it's intense and it's really well put together. The entire fight on the Golden Gate Bridge with the apes fighting the police, you would think it would be cheesy, you would think it would be stupid, but because you care so much and because the movie has taken itself seriously and because the action is so well choreographed and because it's so intense, you buy into it and you buy into those moments and it's exciting and it just makes for this awesome finale and it just feels like one of those old school Hollywood blockbuster moments, like the moment where Caesar comes out riding on a horse come on that's amazing i remember being so excited when i saw that the filmmaking here is fantastic i think it's really great i know rupert wyatt hasn't really done anything massive since this movie i know he's done a couple films here and there but i think overall he did an excellent job putting this entire movie together i don't think he gets enough credit for this trilogy he kicked things off he started it matt reeves may have taken things to the finish line and may have improved a lot of things but i think you have to give a lot of credit to rupert wyatt because he started this thing and he started it off so strong and then something i still haven't even talked Talked about, which is another massive reason behind this movie's success, is the visual effects. The CGI in this film is groundbreaking. The apes look so photoreal in so many shots. Obviously, there are shots that don't hold up, and I'll get to that in a second. But at the time, this was next level. This was some of the most incredible, realistic looking CGI anyone had ever seen. The level of detail in the apes' faces and in the fur and in the movement was stunning. I mean, it was really, really something special. I also think that the practical motion capture filming helped make the apes feel more real and like they're a part of this world, you know, because they're not shooting on some sound stage in front of a green screen and going to be comped in later. They're actually on the set interacting with the other actors in the environment that the scene takes place in. It really makes a world of difference. And I'm so glad that the technology eventually evolved to the point where this was possible. And it's in a place that's believable and makes the movie believable. Like I did mention earlier, some of the shots don't quite hold up. There are a handful of VFX shots in this that look a little cartoony, they look a little fake, they look a little too CG, and you can definitely tell that they're CG. But for the most part, I think this still does hold up very well visually. It doesn't hold up as well as Dawn and War, and I have a lot more to say about the visuals in those movies when I get to them. But not necessarily low budget, but relative to the next two movies and relative to most blockbusters that come out, the visual effects in this look incredible, and it was just such an achievement what they were able to do. Another one of my favorite elements of the movie is Patrick Doyle's 
music. I think this is one of the most underrated musical scores in any modern blockbuster. Nobody ever talks about it. Whenever people mention movie scores of the last few years, some of their favorites, never once have I heard this one mentioned. And I don't know why, because it's awesome. I think his music is epic, it's powerful, and I think it also does about as much of the emotional work as Caesar and Andy Serkis does and the storytelling does. His music really does a great job at, like he said he wanted to do, being able to convey the emotions and drive the story forward when you have characters that have no dialogue. And I think he really pulls that off in a really great way. He also captures that young adult rebellion nature of the story as it builds throughout the movie. And I think maybe he got some of that from doing Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, which is another score that I think is fantastic. And maybe he took some influence from that. But I think his music in this movie is so good. I think it rivals the Michael Giacchino music from the next two movies, which I think is fantastic. But I think this is almost up there, if not on that same level. I really think people, when watching this movie, should pay more attention to the music because it is almost as much of a character as Caesar is, in my opinion. I just, I think it's so good and it really helps sell the story and sell the emotion of the movie as a whole. And then getting into some of what this movie is trying to say, what it's talking about when it comes to its themes and its morals. And I think the biggest one, and it's probably the most obvious one, is posing the question about should we try to control nature? Are we supposed to control things that are not meant to be controlled? A strong will. My father was gone. This drug brought him back. You never saw how bad he was. He has his life again. What about Caesar? What about him? Where does he fit in? Where's the line? What we should do, what we shouldn't do, what's okay, what's not okay? When does it go from trying to better humanity to pushing things too far? It poses these questions, and I've always really appreciated that about this movie. It also gets into stuff about animal testing and animal cruelty. It's more just, I don't know if I'd say surface level, but it does touch on it a bit. It shows the horrors of it, it shows the cruelty of it, it shows the wrongness of it in a way, just by having it present throughout the movie. So I really appreciate that as well. Overall, I love Rise of the Planet of the Apes. It was such an excellent way of bringing back the franchise for a modern audience. You have a great lead character with a smart, well-written, well-directed story. The third act is amazing and ends the movie on such a high note, and it's such a great start to what would become an all-time great trilogy and one of my favorites in the Planet of the Apes series. This is a fantastic movie. I'm sure I will talk about it more as we get closer to Kingdom and beyond that. And I want to know what you guys think of Rise of the Planet of the Apes in the comments down below. Let me know your thoughts on this movie. Do you agree with my points? Do you disagree with anything I had to say? I know some people look at this movie like it's the weak one of the series. So if you're one of those that maybe has a few more issues with it, let me know. If you love this movie as much as I do, please let me know that as well. And if you haven't seen the movie yet, let me know if this review got you interested enough in checking the movie out. I hope it did because it's a really great movie that is 100% worthy of your time. I will be back again very soon with my review for the next movie in the Caesar trilogy, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. Thank you so much for checking out today's video here on Ape Nation. If you liked this video, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and hit that notification bell so that you can stay up to date on all things apes. I'll catch you in the next one, so until then, goodbye.